Now I'd like to go into more detail about how I detect a probable ecological strike and invasion in progress when observing media reports. When studying environmental disasters and impending projects, here are some clues that I think signify acts of ecological warfare. Location. If an extractive project is situated in a highly sensitive area that should be off limits to such toxic practices, then I'm suspicious. It's known that you do not risk irreversibly poisoning natural resources that are vital for life with projects that will certainly pollute. It doesn't make sense using common logic. Anyone who doesn't know what they're up to may be baffled when they see this happening. Or perhaps they just attribute it to greed and may not observe the more horrendous motives. It's also known that because of the deadly chemicals and revolting scenery, you do not launch a hydraulic fracturing project near a daycare center school, hospital, or old age home. Again, those who do notice these oddities may not consider the sinister motives and just attribute it to standard corruption and greed. When I see things like this, I surmise the ruling psychopaths are trying to render that area off limits with audiovisual commotion and a chemical munition, and quite possibly the people within that zone are scheduled for soft extermination. Multiple strikes to the same area. If an area is being clobbered with disasters, that tells me they are in a hurry to impair that resource, especially if the incidents occur within a short time span. Ignored warnings. The corporation that caused the destruction may ignore warnings by regulators and government officials. So when the disaster occurs, it is no surprise because they knew it was going to happen. If they were told that their activities were going to cause a catastrophe and they did not alter their procedures and a disaster occurred, then that is not an accident. In some cases, the industry ignored multiple warnings before an environmental tragedy occurred. Amount and consistency. Accidents happen. People make mistakes. There are equipment failures. However, these incidents are never ending. And in some cases, the same corporation has caused multiple sizable disasters. Some of them have a long history of hideous pollution. Then there's the magnitude these catastrophes are enormous. In the case of an oil spill or tailing storage facility breach, we're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, and even billions of gallons of toxic industrial material per incident. This clue alone should tell you that there is something wrong. deception. If politicians, government, academia, NGOs, regulators, or industry resort to deception at any point, that is a cause for alarm. If, for instance, there's evidence of a cover-up 
or an effort by a regulator or politician to bypass land management protocols and sneak a dangerous project into a sensitive zone, they may be opening the gates for a weapon of mass destruction. This deception blends into the next clue, ignoring protocols. Protocol dismissal. If regulators are not following procedures, if they are skipping guidelines, fast tracking, or if they are in any way colluding with the industry, that tells me that at the very least they are compromised and perhaps they are being used to pave the way for a weapon of mass destruction. Similarly, if a corporation with a demonstrable record of brazen environmental destruction is trying to install a large pipeline that carries highly volatile liquids through a densely populated residential area near schools and homes, then that is alarming especially if the permit for that pipeline was issued under felonious conditions involving criminal mischief and bribery. unchanging excuses. You see the same generic excuses over and over. They include things like mechanical failures, leaky valves, unknown causes, misjudgments, clumsiness, mishaps during routine maintenance, accidental strikes during construction, and the notorious operator error. Despite decades of recurrent major disasters, these corporations have still not gotten around to fixing those glitches that have been contaminating the natural supplies that are critical for life. Postponed recognition. The problem is not immediately noticed. I suspect the reason is to give the weapon enough time to contaminate the environment. In some cases, these corporate employees are so negligent that regular citizens must file a report before they finally acknowledge the problem. Regardless of all the safeguards, including human and automatic detection mechanisms, days, weeks, months and even years may pass before the problem receives sufficient attention. Even technologically advanced facilities have dumped huge amounts of sickening waste into the environment when operators ignored the alarms. That leads us to the next clue. the slow response. This is the characteristic sign of a planned environmental disaster. When the problem is finally noticed, the reaction is slow. A variety of stories are used to justify the sluggish effort to stop the gush of pollution. I've determined that in reality, the response is slow in order to ensure that the weapon is totally discharged and to give the expelled poison enough time to thoroughly contaminate the environment. Comprehensive Impact this ties in with the location clue, 
It's the damage that the disaster caused to the stricken community. If you study reports of these catastrophes, you notice a common theme. That zone was their lifeline that they depended on, their food and water supply. It was also part of their local economy that may have included fishing or tourism. Maybe it had some historic and cultural value. So these are multi-pronged strikes. The resulting damage is biological, environmental, social, cultural, economical, and psychological. Information blockade. After the attack, vital information is withheld from the targeted community and general public. Affected people are excluded from post-disaster meetings. Some residents are not even told that there was a disaster. They are not sufficiently informed of dangers. Perhaps no-fly zones are implemented and the media is denied access. There is no real cleanup, initially or at all. That, I figure, is because a prompt and true cleanup would defeat the whole purpose of the attack. Genuine cleanup crews must be rejected because if they get there early enough, then some actual remediation may occur. So, to ensure that the weapon causes as much environmental damage as possible, the cleanup is postponed and local support crews are blocked. There may be a sham cleanup or the complete absence of a cleanup. chemical dispersants. If crude oil is employed as a weapon of mass destruction in a coastal zone, then under the facade of a cleanup, dispersants may be sprayed from aircraft. The excuse for the spraying is that the chemicals break down the oil on the surface of the water and prevent it from circulating. In reality, this is the second phase of the chemical attack. Neurotoxic Corexit has been linked to brain damage, fertility problems, birth defects, genetic mutations, and cancer. These dispersants are deadly and actually increase the toxicity of the spill. Pacification in the post-attack phase, environmental ministries, politicians, and corporate spokespeople make public statements that are misleading regarding the extent of environmental damage and danger posed to human health. During this phase, the affected community is given false information by the corporation and puppeteered government that have formed an alliance against them. These statements may include outright lies. tanker ships. The MV Wakazio that struck the coast of Mauritius is used in this segment as an example of what to look for regarding tanker disasters. If there is a gigantic impaired ship loaded with a million gallons of fuel and other toxic industrial material floating a mile off a coast of an island 
occupied by people who have clean natural resources and the government of that nation is not earnestly concerned about that vessel then that is disturbing if that impaired ship is not supposed to be there in the first place for instance if it deviated miles off course due to some navigational error before striking a coral reef a mile off the coast then that makes the situation even more suspicious if after the collision the lame tanker loaded with tims had floated off that coast for 12 days and the government of that nation did not express concern then that tells me the placement of that ship was probably intentional if that tanker spilled some of its toxic contents and the response was slow that is another pointer regarding the impact clue that was previously covered if the affected community had its lifeline spoiled that is another hint of an attack for instance if the area was part of a major fishing industry that provided food for a lot of people or if the shoreline contained unsullied lagoons that were packed with fresh fish and drinking water the pollution of such natural resources fundamentally prunes the food and water reserves of those people and economically harms them further economic harm would ensue if their economy was partially based on tourism a fumbled cleanup in a situation like this would confirm to me that it was probably not an accident if in addition to these clues the government of that impacted zone resorts to deception or if there's evidence of a cover-up then I'm certain that catastrophe was a planned attack and that tanker was used as an improvised weapon of mass destruction so regarding tanker incidents these are some things to be on the lookout for Compounding factors and design flaws. Some of these catastrophes include a variety of determinants that go back to the design of the industrial facility. It appears some of these structures are built to fail. If so, then that means they're planning these attacks years or decades in advance. I think the Chernobyl disaster of April 1986 is a good example. That lethal incident that released the radioactive equivalent of 500 Hiroshima bombs and sent clouds of radiation all over Europe is attributed to a cluster of unfortunate coincidences that were all synchronized. Things like the removal of multiple safety mechanisms, protocol dismissals, design flaws, and operator errors. It seems to me this mixture of unfortunate factors all occurring simultaneously is unnatural and does not usually happen unless it's planned. Especially the transgression of non-negotiable protocols like shutting down all protection systems if such a disaster is followed up with a slow response marginalizing dangers withholding crucial health precautions that would have minimized disease information blockade delayed evacuation of the contaminated zone and lies then that confirms to me it was no accident. Malfunctional pollution control and detection equipment. In this case, pollution detection and control mechanisms are broken or down for repairs. 
for whatever reason, the vital equipment that gauges and filters deadly fumes is offline for days, weeks, and even months. Excuses are used that it's too expensive to repair and the facility must continue operation in order to save jobs. This scenario serves as a reasonable cover for a chemical attack. Communities in the examples listed here were exposed to enormous quantities of poison such as nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, sulfur dioxide, benzene, and carbon monoxide. This occurred in Harris County, southwestern Texas, at Royal Dutch Shell's Deer Park Complex, where, during a series of equipment failures between 2003 and 2007, they were able to routinely contaminate the air with an incredible amount of toxic smog. Royal Dutch Shell and ExxonMobil also used this tactic in Fife County, Scotland, with faulty pollution monitors in February 2020. There, the residents were exposed to a surplus of hazardous fumes. Yet, as we will observe in the Echo Side Machines chapter, this event in 2020 was not an isolated incident. The communities around this weapons system, just outside of Cowdenbeath, have been under severe attack for years. This excuse was used by BP in Galveston County, Texas, in the spring of 2010. Reportedly, a key piece of equipment was offline during a repair that lasted 40 days. Instead of ceasing production, the company continued to generate gasoline, during which time the community of 44,000 people was exposed to 500,000 pounds of poisonous fumes. BP's Whitting Refinery on the southern shore of Lake Michigan, operated with malfunctional pollution control equipment intermittently from 2015 to 2019. During this period, BP illegally discharged incredible amounts of toxic soot that is known to cause respiratory and cardiovascular disease. The corporation did not report this emission violation and equipment failure as required by law. BP's unlawful discharge of pollutants from its Whitting refinery goes back to at least 2003. U.S. Steel resorted to this approach in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. In December of 2018, some pollution control equipment got damaged. Instead of shutting down the operation, with the support of most politicians, including Pennsylvania's Lieutenant Governor, U.S. Steel exposed those residents to lifespan shortening fumes for over three months. So these are some clues that signify criminal activity regarding environmental disasters and natural resource development projects that are underway. With this background information, let's move on to the topic of area and resource denial that I've noticed is a major component of this biosphere disintegration protocol.